Several reasons why prayer is so important. It's number one. When you pray, you exercise your spirit so that all your potentials can find expression. Every believer is decked with enormous potentials. I have taught you here before. All of us seated here, we have the Holy Spirit. And so by extension, the nine gifts of the Spirit can manifest through us. Because when we talk about the gift of the Spirit, it's not that the Holy Ghost is giving faith, giving this. No, he's manifesting different. The gift of the Spirit is actually called the charisma of the Holy Ghost. So the way you find a footballer, one is doing hard man, another one is all those things are charisma. So word of knowledge is a charisma of the Spirit. Word of wisdom is a charisma. Healing is a charisma. So the Holy Ghost flows through you depending on which one you give allowance to. The gift is not healing. It's not word of knowledge. The Holy Ghost is the gift. But the nine are trapped in the Holy Ghost. And they're actually more than nine. So everybody sitting here has the capacity to manifest all the gifts of the Spirit. Number two, you have an anointing on your life that should make you do mighty works. In Acts 10, 38, it says how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power. In Acts 1, 8, it says you too. Not many days from now, you shall be anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. So it's the same anointing on Jesus that is on your life. And then the faith of Jesus is the same faith you have. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he spoke to us. He said we have like precious faith. And in Galatians 2, 20, Paul said, I have the faith of the Son of God. So the faith you have now is the faith of Jesus. In Romans chapter 12 verse 3, it says God dealt to every one of us the measure of faith we require for a glorious destiny. And you, God didn't stop there. You have the life of Jesus. The very life that powered Jesus. That's the life you have. He said this is the record. 1 John 5 11, whoever had the son has life. And he said these things have I written unto you verse 13 that you might know that you have eternal life. So you have the life of Jesus, you have the faith of Jesus, you have the anointing of Jesus, you have the spirit of Jesus. You are too low dead with potentials. The challenge is that you are not exercised. So the potentials can't find expression. It's like a young man who goes to a gym. He may go to a lanky, give him eight months. All he needs to do is to carry iron. As he's carrying iron, he's putting pressure on the muscle. He's putting pressure on the muscle. After a while, the muscles will become stiff. A friend of mine who is a footballer, he came to my house and he told me, ah, why are you light like this? I said, what do you mean? He touched me, he said, Abba, Abba, this one is bread now. Is this a man's skin? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, touch me. When I touched him, his body was like block. I now touch myself, truly, my body was like foam. Ah, he said, touch my stomach. As I touched, the stomach was like concrete. I said, what is this? He said, wait, let me show you. He now sat in a posture, hung his leg and his hand. He said, do it. I did it for five seconds. I felt that. He said, you put pressure, put pressure. So when they carry iron, when they are running on the treadmill, they are putting pressure on the lungs and they are putting pressure on the muscles. It's called cardiovascular fitness and cardiomuscular fitness. One toughens your muscles. Another one toughens your lungs your blood vessels so that you become like a rod and if you do it for eight months for one year for two years when you come out they will no longer recognize you the people that were trying to bully you before all you need to do is to remove your shirt and just find yourself when they see what's happening they will know that you went somewhere you are a change man meanwhile all of that potential was there but it, it will take raising some metals to put pressure there. So the Bible said in 1 Timothy 4, 8, it said bodily exercise profited little. It said but godliness profited more. For it profits in this life and in the life that is to come. And one of the dimensions of godliness that builds you up in Jude verse 20, it said building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. When a Christian begins to pray, it's like he has entered the gym. What's the second benefit of prayer? Prayer helps you to access the proceeding world. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, it says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded 
from the mouth of God. Meanwhile, the proceeding word is what makes you invincible. Don't make the mistake of thinking if you have Genesis to Revelation in your head, you'll be wise. Go and meet some theologians. You will see how terribly confused they are. Jesus met the Pharisees. He said, you cite the scripture. Because you think in them, you find eternal life. He said, but they speak of me. So you can read the whole scripture and not find Jesus. Until the proceeding word comes to you. That's what we make that verse make sense. That's what we make that chapter make sense. So when you are done praying, reading, studying, meditating, you must add prayer. When you now add prayer, what prayer does is that it gives you access to where the scriptures came from. That's why 2 Peter 1.20 he said, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. He said, holy men of God, they spake as they were carried by the spirit of God. These men were moved. They were moved. They came to a point where they journeyed to where life dwells. So they understood the scripture because they accessed it in the spirit. It was John that was speaking in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 and 10. He said, I, John, am your brother in tribulation. And he said, I was on the eye called Patmos. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he said, suddenly, I heard a sound as of a trumpet. The guy had read Bible. But now, he needed to interact with the living world. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard a sound as of a trumpet. He said, as I turned, he now went to where the scriptures came from. I saw seven golden lampstands. And he said, in between them, I saw one walking. Even the Jesus he read in scripture, he now met him in glory. He didn't know him anymore. Because now, what he's reading is not Logos. He has been brought to interact with the living world. And Jesus had to introduce himself again. I am Alpha, Omega. I am the one who was, who is, and who is to come. I'm the one who was dead, but now I live forevermore. And Jesus began to explain to him, this is the mystery of the seven stars. This is the mystery of the seven candles. It's when the proceeding word begins to come. That's when you become wise. That's when you become powerful. This is why it's not enough to load yourself with logos. Choke prayer with the word. The third thing prayer does for you is that prayer engenders transformation and transfiguration. How can you imagine that the Pharisees, knowing every literally every verse of the of the world yet they were full of flesh and mischievity because they didn't interact with the one they were studying about when you begin to pray transformation and transfiguration begins to take place and jesus revealed some of these things to us so that we can pattern our lives in matthew 17 verse 2 the bible said after eight days Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the mountain and he said, Dear, as he prayed, after six days, he said, As he prayed, he said, The fashion of his countenance was altered. He said, His raiment began to glister, and even the clothes Jesus wore began to shine. So Jesus knew the organic technology of transformation that when a man begins to pray, begin to happen and it was in the latter verse of that scripture that we now saw why transfiguration was taking place because when you start praying you begin to behold and any realm and any being you behold you are transformed into that realm or that being because the bible said they appeared before him Moses and Elijah so he had to take his glory form in order to commune at that level there are few who are beholding we look Facebook and we enter pornography. Enter all kinds of godless practices. And we are wondering, why are we struggling with masturbation? That's what you are beholding. Why am I struggling with immorality? That's what you are beholding. It's the law of giggle. What you goggle in is what you goggle out. You are not different from what you see and hear. And so what you need to do is to censor your atmosphere through prayer. And when you censor it and the realm covers you, you cannot but live like that realm. It's not everybody that is struggling. Everybody who is struggling is struggling because he's seeing and hearing the wrong thing. But for those who have made up their mind to live beholding, every day 
new level of glory comes out of them. Because if you pray, you will see. Number four, why is prayer important? And why must we pray? Legislation and litigation is not possible except by prayer. What is litigation? Is the act of probing. Is the act of judging. And is the act of in enforcing the laws of God. The will of God. The mind of God. That's litigation. What is legislation? Is the act of enacting laws. Is the act of writing laws. Policies in the spirit. Everybody who prays can bring the law of God over a system. He can bring the law of God over a territory. You can see somebody who is dying of sickness. You know that what God said is health. The only way you can move him from sickness to health is when you know the way of prayer. Because that's how you enforce the will of God. It's called legislation and litigation. So number one, you can judge that sickness. You can judge the demon responsible. And when you are done dealing with the demon, then you now insist on the will of God. This is why we pray. If you don't pray, the will of God will not happen. When Jesus was praying in Matthew chapter 6, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. So it is prayer that establishes the will of God which is in heaven on earth. Number five, prayer is for intimacy and for deep intercourse with the Spirit of God. Because there are secrets in God that are not for the public. I've taught you before about the tabernacles of old. There is the outer court where the whole congregation gather. There is the inner court where only the priest can go to. The outer court is illuminated by the sun. That's why you can come to church. You have people with different philosophies and different ideologies. They are illuminated by the sun. Society can still inspire them. But when you go to the inner court, the rays of the sun are not permitted. It's only the menorah that lightens men there. The light of the government of God. And there is yet another place deeper than the inner court. It's called the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest goes there. And the man who reaches the Holy of Holies knows the Shekinah by experience. For him, it's not something he reads in the book. It's a being that he encounters. And everyone who wants to grow in God and become the joy of many generations must build intimacy through prayer. I quoted for you already from Psalm 91. See what the Bible says. I will show you how God becomes a personal God, not a congregational God. He says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He said, He. Because this is a journey for every individual. It's not we. It's not them. He that dwelleth in the secret place. And then see verse 2. He didn't say, They shall say. He said, I will say of the Lord. The Lord is the Lord of everybody. But everybody may not have the authority to say it. I will say of the Lord. He is my. He didn't say he's our refuge. That's why 10,000 people can be in the church. One person has never seen an affliction. But you see 100 others. Because it's not we will say of our refuge. I will say he is my refuge. And then he went further. And my fortress. This is the one that blew my mind. My God. In him will I trust. When you begin to journey with God. He's no longer the God of Abraham. He's no longer the God of Isaac. He's no longer the God of Jacob. He's no longer the God of Apostle Michael Roku. He becomes my God. So you are no longer trusting in the God of Abraham. You are no longer just trusting in the God of Isaac. You can now say, my God. In him will I trust. Prayer. System of intimacy. That's where you access the secrets of God. Sir, can I tell you something? You are very poor if you have no secret with God. No matter the name you have, no matter what you have in your account, your wealth is the secret that you have with God. Abraham never judged his wealth by cattle. Isaac never judged his wealth by cattle. Jacob never judged his wealth by cattle. All of those things were byproducts. You know what these men did? When they want to die, they transferred their heritage with God to their children. The Bible said Abraham gave gifts to the sons of Keturah. 
But he said to Isaac, he gave the promise. He had something with God. When Isaac was about to die, he said, get for me a savory venison. I will eat and my soul will bless you. And he laid hands on his son and transferred an inheritance. And Jacob, when he was about to die, he said, gather around me, you sons of Jacob. I will tell you the things that will befall you. It was there he made Judah a king. He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. What do you have? You are, you are bragging on money that governments of nations put value on. You are bragging on titles that systems put value on. I am manager. I am chairman. What happens if that bank goes down tomorrow? If that company goes down tomorrow, who are you? Everyone must walk with God until he becomes a custodian. And when you walk, walk with the consciousness that you have something in God. That's the sign that you have paid the price of prayer. Because God can commit something to you as a custodian. Finally, prayer gives you room to participate in the world that is to come. He said when Jesus was praying, he said there appeared to him Moses and Elijah. And he was legislating over matters of the ages that is to come. Matters of the world that is to come. When John was carried to heaven, he was interacting with matters of the ages to come. Prayer will make you, it will immortalize you. Because some of the things you catch on the altar and some of the transactions you carry, even when you are long gone, those transactions will remain. Did you not read about Abel? The Bible said even while he was dead, he said his blood was crying from the ground. The guy had become an immortal through altar interactions, transactions on the altars of God. If all your life is about is time-based, it means your life is short. Even if you live for a hundred years, your life is short. When men begin to pray and transact on the altar, they end up with legacies and transactions that are immortal in nature. That even when they are long gone, those things will remain as a memorial in the house of God.